if you want to jump straight ahead to um, the model itself so that you can just see it in overview, by all means do so. There'll be a clip up here somewhere for you to do that with on the YouTube uh, copy of this. So this is Badley and Hitch's working memory model, originally published in 1974, but originating in work that the, particularly Badley, but also Hitch had done with him in the 60s and the 70s. So they proposed their model on the basis of two dimensions of evidence, clinical and experimental. And that's one of the reasons why it's very appealing. Stuff that just comes out of experimental evidence is very often criticised for lacking real-world validity or ecological validity. Stuff that just comes from clinical cases um, is very often criticised because you, it's drawing conclusions about the whole of human behaviour on the basis of a very limited and very particular set of data. People are already poorly. So here's some of the clinical evidence that they would have used. This is the very famous case of Henry Malaisen, and his case was written up by a lady called Brenda Milner, who's still at work in psychology, a very famous psychologist. So Henry, poor chap, had a dreadful um, epilepsy that was very, very debilitating and had to be operated on. Had to, they used a very specific surgical procedure in Canada at the time to um, sever the, the corpus callosum in his brain so that it would isolate and hopefully reduce the, um, the effect of the epilepsy in the temporal lobes. Uh, it did that, um, but it also as a consequence it damaged his hippocampus and he had significant amnesias afterwards, which Brenda wrote up and worked with him on. Um, so here's the devil giving us the details here. So anterograde amnesia is one kind of amnesia, and that's the uh, inability to recall events once a particular thing has happened. And the opposite is retrograde amnesia, and that's the inability to recall events before a particular thing has happened. So if you think about the, like the cartoon version of amnesia, somebody gets a bump on the head, and then they can't remember who they are or where they came from or whatever. And they become very biddable as well for some reason, it's almost like a hypnotic state, or oh, do whatever you want. Um, now, the bump on the head will sometimes cause amnesias, but amnesia isn't simple. It's, it's a, it covers a, a variety of different conditions. Uh, the basic distinction here between anterograde and retrograde is one whereby the classic comedy am amnesia is retrograde. I can't remember what happened to me before the bang on the head. Anterograde amnesia is where I can't make new memories after the bang on the head or traumatic incidents. And that's the thing, amnesias are very often associated with traumatic events. Uh, it could be um, a blow to the skull. It could be, uh, as in the case of Clive Waring, it could be to do with a, a disease that gets into the, the brain stem and causes damage in the nervous system. It could also be a consequence of substance misuse or um, Genetic factors might influence it. So we've got a number of different reasons why people develop amnesia, but they develop them in two ways. And this distinction between the anterograde and the retrograde is something that supports the idea that there might be two types of memory, long-term and short-term. And that's very important in the development of memory study in the late 20th century. Incidentally, whilst we're on the topic, nobody was ever cured of amnesia by banging them on the head a second time. That, that's just in the stories. So there's the clinical evidence. We also had some experimental evidence that Badley in particular had worked up in the 60s when he was looking at the differences between acoustically similar and semantically similar stimulus material. So that, that's kind of a mouthful, but acoustically similar, words that sound the same. Semantically similar, words that have similar meanings. So if I've got um, a list of words like the man, mad, map, cap thing, they're all acoustically similar. They sound very, very similar to one another. And if we present that stimulus material to somebody and ask them to recall it very quickly, very soon after the presentation, then their recall of it is impaired by acoustic similarity. So words that sound the same are harder to recall from short-term memory. However, if they make it from short-term memory into long-term memory, if sufficient rehearsal takes place, for example, then later on, acoustically similar words are actually not too hard to recall. In fact, we know we, we use rhyme and rhythm and meter, acoustic characteristics, to help us remember stuff. However, semantically similar, words that have similar meanings, do become harder to recall from long-term memory, whereas semantic similarity appears to have no impact on short-term memory recall. So that was Badley's finding from, I think it was 1966. And that... That basis of evidence is what gives rise to their development, Babby and Hitch's development of this thing called the dual task interference paradigm. Before we go on, just a little bit of a word about this, this funny thing, the paradigm. I mean, it's spelled funny for a start, isn't it? 
you'll hear people attempting to say it as paradigm and things. Um, there is no rule about pronunciation because it comes from a, a long dead language, the Greek, and uh, so we make the best sense of it we can. But in social sciences, paradigm has got a, a very big range. It means a lot of different stuff. And this is particularly due to something that came from a chap called Thomas Kuhn. Kuhn suggested that scientific thinking went through a series of revolutionary and evolutionary stages. So the evolutionary, the slower process, is where we accumulate new knowledge that fits in with our broad picture, our paradigm. And then at some point, evidence that doesn't fit in can no longer be ignored, becomes too, there's too much of it knocking around, and so we have to change the paradigm, change the way we look at the world, causing a paradigm shift. So a paradigm is a pattern of behaviour or thinking that helps us to make sense of stuff. And Badley and Hitch have the, the sense of paradigm kind of similar to that, so they, their dual task interference paradigm is a way of doing, it's a way of doing experiments. It's like this. Give the participant two tasks to perform at the same time, so dual tasks, two at once, yeah, and hopefully they will interfere with one another. So here's my two tasks. I can ask you to walk and chew gum, something that I find difficult. Um, especially if I make the first task, the walking task, really, really complicated. See, but you put it on a tightrope, it's going to get hard to do that. Use up a lot of the resources, a lot of kinesthetic resources required to do this process. Right, now the second task should depend on another part of the system. In this case, I'm thinking about the biological system. So this here depends upon, you know, feet and ears and things because of your balance. Here, chewing gum depends upon your lower jaw and your teeth and things. Now, if there's an impact on the performance of the second task, the gum chewing task, you can then claim that the first task's resources were useful in the completion of the second task. So there's the, there's the decrement in performance, yeah? Got the idea? Okay. So let's have a look at that in practice. So, Badley and Hitch are inspired by these clinical evidence and uh, they want to take more effective control of the extraneous variables. So that instead of doing naturalistic type of experiments, waiting for nature to vary the, um, the amnesiac function or, or the uh, amnesiac dysfunction, sorry, instead of doing naturalistic experiments, they want to do proper lab experiments and take a bit more control. So this is going to allow them to separate out the different functions of working memory. So they used a dual task interference type activities, the ones we were just talking about, to, to look at the different functions. Okay, so here's one type of activity. This is a, a verbal reasoning, well, it's not even a reasoning task, is it? It's a verbal task with some executive function. This is the famous articulatory suppression Brown Peterson technique, counting backwards in threes from a very large number. Okay, so that's one type of task. All right, that's, that allows us to investigate or explore phonological function. That's the processing of sounds and sequences. All right, then we've got a second type of task, harder to do. This is to do with visual and kinesthetic functions and the processing of distributions, how things are shared out, maybe in space, but also could be in other ways as well, across ranges of some sort. So I've got an example of that here. This is, um, this is me using one of the, uh, the toys that the children have on the laptop. So there's a pattern to be repeated. Yeah? And as that pattern is repeated, we give them another task to do, a reasoning task or a verbal task, and we observe for changes in accuracy, so we look for how close they are to the centre of the dot each time. So that was the idea there. So here, the counting backwards in threes, the brown beat does an articulatory suppression, that's a central executive and verbal task. If it was merely making a noise, Badly used to use cola, cola, cola apparently, if it was merely making a noise, it would simply be a verbal task. But because we're asking them to count backwards in threes, it's also a central executive task. And then we've got the visuospatial task here, dabbing the dot, you know, putting the dot in a circle. So they argued on the basis of these findings that there's a third component in working memory, which they called the central executive. And this was originally thought of as a relatively simple thing. It's just thinking of a coordinating role. But it rapidly became a source of some kind of problems or concerns. And now we're going to move on to the model itself. So there were further refinements in this, including this thing called the episodic buffer. So first part of the model that we're going to look at is this thing here, the phonological loop. And here we think about this inner ear, inner voice thing, and they're sort of in a cycle. So that's basic rote rehearsal, I guess, in the sense that we are familiar with from our studies in memory. So there's the phonological loop. And the other thing that we have is this visuospatial sketch pad. 
or scratch pad you might see it seen as sometimes. The idea being that there is somewhere in our minds, in our brains, that we use to represent the distribution of things across, uh, well, I suppose, like a surface, really, um, like in a room or across a television screen or something like that. Now, those two components, those two slave systems, are supposed to feed into this thing, the central executive, we coordinated by it. Now, I'm going to explain why I've chosen this rather ugly-looking person to be the central executive in a minute or two. It's called a homunculus. But the other thing that was inserted into this was this episodic buffer. Now, the episodic buffer takes over the function that was originally allocated to the central executive of basically running these two streams of information into one another, of binding things together. And so this binding function was handed over to the episodic buffer. The later experiments actually reveal that the binding function may not take place in the episodic buffer, but the essential thing to get out of this is that originally functions that were found here in the central executive get unbound from this and put elsewhere in the model. And that's, that's really important. You can see why in a minute or two. Now, so the central executive also has to feed the episodic buffer too. Then the other things that we've got to know about this are where does this all relate to long-term memory? And initially, long-term memory was thought to be accessed through the central executive, but it was rapidly realised on the basis of further experimental evidence that the long-term memory also has to have a relationship to the episodic buffer and presumably also to the phonological loop and to the visuospatial sketch pad. And this is so that we can use things that are in long-term memory, like our knowledge and understanding of spoken language, in order to make sense of sensory input without having to pay attention. So this is like the cocktail party effect. If you're in a busy room and somebody says your name, you hear it even though there's a lot of other counter signal to take into account. And that argument there is your central executive didn't pay attention until the phonological dimension of the working memory had taken something from long-term memory and paired it up with something that was taking place in the immediate environment. So that kind of thinking suggests that there's got to be connections between all really the different parts of this model and long-term memory, which has led to some people criticizing badly and saying, well, really what you're saying is Working memory is merely activated long-term memory. Now, Badley has suggested that that's not what he means and that it kind of misses the point of what the man is saying. So his working memory model suggests that there are these different functions which draw upon content from long-term memory but are separate to long-term memory and he uses experimental and clinical evidence to support that. Now the original central executive, remember I said this is like a homunculus, that means little person. And homunculus is a criticism that we make of any psychological model. If you've got a, a model that, that takes, say, sensory input, uh, memory processing, attention, long-term recall, and stuff like that, it, it's, that's a model of the mind, but it, very often you'll suddenly find there'll be a, a bit inside of it that seems like a decision-maker. And the decision-maker will also have a mind. And that's like the homunculus, there's the little man inside the big man. So the big person has inside him this little person. Now, homunculus is a criticism that we can make of lots of different models, lots of different theories in psychology. But essentially, Badley's position on the homunculus criticism is, I know there's a homunculus, and it's okay for there to be one in the model, provided it's used as a place marker, saying we've got more work to do here. We've got to work out what this thing is and what, what it does. And so, in a way, the development of the episodic buffer is a subtraction of some of the functions that were originally in the central executive homunculus. And so, hopefully, as the model evolves and develops, the homunculus becomes less and less significant as its functions get distributed across the different parts of the model. So, in some ways, we can think of the development of the model as a response to the idea of the central executive homunculus. The different functions of the central executive have been steadily investigated and reallocated to different components of the model. So, the models become more sophisticated and increased in its complexity as it accommodates more and more clinical and experimental insights. And that's why it's good science. It gets more complicated as it needs to, not more complicated at the start. It's like Einstein said, an idea should be as complex as it needs to, but no more complex than that.